Thank you all very much. I really appreciate you coming to be here. Um, you're probably here because you're either using Power BI and you want to use it better, or you're not using it, you're thinking about it, and uh, kind of want a little bit of info on how to on-ramp into to Power BI as a tool. Um, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes kind of reviewing what we talked about in part one, because I do see a few new faces out here, and I, I don't want you to feel like totally lost. Uh, but it was really only about a 20-minute talk, so um, we can we can get you caught up to speed pretty pretty fast there. So I call this Power BI for normal analysts. So it's like you don't really have to be a super technical user to uh, to make Power BI a very useful tool in your toolbox, and that's my goal uh, for today. We're going to talk about kind of overviewing part one, and then my goal for this talk is to show you a very kind of functional, real-world scenario and how you would use Power BI to achieve that business scenario from end to end. Um, one of the things we'll mention is Power BI is Though it is branded like one big technology, that's almost an umbrella term <laughs> for many different technologies that Microsoft brought under the Power BI umbrella and wrapped it all in this nice container that businesses could pay for. <laughs> it was their goal, right? So, um, but, it's, but for analysts, it can be a very powerful, useful tool. You just have to figure out, hey, what technology am I using in this part of Power BI and how do I make it do you know, this, this task? So we're going to use um, all of those things, Power Query, DAX and what I would officially call Power BI, like the Power BI services. Um, so uh, yeah, just to kind of review that, um, this, is, this is a real important kind of fundamental concept to what Power BI is. So what it really is is, again, a collection of technologies. And if you kind of follow just the basic path of Power BI, you say open, get data, what you're going to be doing is actually loading a special kind of database that um, is what Microsoft sometimes calls a tabular model, meaning it's just a bunch of tables, is what those rectangles are, connected by relationships. Um, then they also, the other name for that database engine is Vertipak, which I'll bring that up here in just a second, but it, um, that is like, they've had this product for a long time in SQL Server called Analysis Services. You may have ever heard of that or may have built or connected to a cube. That was SQL Server Analysis Services. This is where this technology came from. And uh, it, so it's very much a, a very good full-fledged database engine that is, has been around since about 2010. And uh, it is, it's in memory. It uses columnar store to, as a way of storing the data. So it compresses the data quite a lot. And that made it pretty friendly for loading data onto a desktop kind of technology. Um, but that's that's what that's at the core of it when you're dealing with Power BI. Unless you're doing direct query, if you're importing data, you're importing it into this kind of a, de a database. Other other technologies have this kind of thing too. Tableau has its own data model they call Hyper. Um, if you were using R, you might be loading it into a, a data frame, right? Or or uh, if you're using Python, you're loading it into a, a data uh, pandas data frame, right? So this is kind of just this is my, this is Power BI's built-in database. So then there's also technologies that load data into this model, right? And then uh, the, that is what is called Power Query, or M. And then um, the other part of Power BI, the part that most people see first, is the technology that can query this kind of tabular model database, this VertiPak database, and render up charts with HTML5. Or so it can show it on your mobile device, or on your browser, or export it as an email, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, there are also, I would also include kind of on that right side, the services that it takes to manage the data model. Uh, their cloud services know how to connect to the data sources and reload the data model, right? Like with, um, if it's, if you're going through an on-premise type of firewall, then you use their technology called gateways. So I kind of just put all that in that third category of it's like, we had this core database technology and we had this really cool data munging language called M. And they, that's what they use to kind of build Power BI on top of. If we put some fancy web wrappers and web services on top of it, then it could be a very useful tool. So that, that's, it's a very broad scope, consisting, you know, comprised of technologies that have been around for 10 years in some cases, in some cases one year, right? And so it's like, um, yeah, it's kind of hard to understand when you start dealing with Power BI, like, what, what is this thing? <laughs> if all you do is open up the desktop and it gives you this blank canvas. So again, that database is called Vertipak. And I, I mention that only because it's helpful if you end up Google searching. Um, 
It was again first with analysis services. Then they created an Excel plugin called Power Pivot. Anybody heard of Power Pivot or been around that? Okay, exact same database exactly. And that language M came out with Power Pivot. Um, that was an ad <clears throat> an add-on to Excel originally, and then it became just part of core Excel. So if you have Excel 2016 or later, and you say get data, you're actually opening up a query editor for M, and and you're going to end up using DAX when you query that data you load. So, so to, to, to walk through all of this is all kind of abstract, to make it more concrete, let's talk about a specific scenario um, that you might get as an analyst at your office. It's based on you know, some real world scenarios that I, I've faced and you've probably faced uh, worse. So let's just say that uh, you're at your desk and you're enjoying a nice quiet Monday like this one. You're thinking, I'm gonna go to the analytics meetup later. Uh, but the, your boss stops by your office and says, uh, Johnson, if that's your name, you know. Uh, I, I need a report, and I need it to combine our historical sales with our current month sales to date. Okay, so I'm sure some of you have heard something like that before. If it wasn't sales, it was clicks, or it was, you know, orders, or it was inventory, those kinds of things. You say, all right, boss, where do we keep historical sales? Um, and your boss replies, oh, it's in our company database. That's... SQL something, I think, uh, and they're all there after a month-end close. So the data in there is clean, and it's, it's accurate, it's good, accounting signed off on it, and you say, oh, good, I know, I know SQL because I attended Kimberly Collins' last talk on, on intro to SQL. Um, I can do that, and, and so, so then what system do we track our current month sales in if I was trying to try to get July sales? And they go, system, uh, well, uh, it's, on, it's on Larry's CPU. This is intentional, by the way. I'm saying CPU instead of laptop because uh, this is your boss talking, right? Um, so, and uh, yeah, Larry, he just updates his Excel spreadsheet every day. So you're like, oh, okay, this is going to be interesting. How am I going to get data out of a SQL database and data off of some person's desktop and combine it into some report that makes sense? So this is actually the scenario we're going to try to walk through. Um, you could break this up into four overall steps. First, we're going to connect to SQL to get the previous data, which will be the easiest part, thankfully. Um, then we'll try to pull our current month sales out of Excel. I can show you how we'll use Power Query to combine that information. And actually, there's a fourth, a fourth requirement I didn't put in this little dialogue that, let's say you could also, we're going to import another data source that recategorizes the items that we sell. So uh, I'll show you that. But it's, I think you'll, when you see it, you'll say, oh yeah, I recognize having to do that before in my scenarios. Um, so our step one, we're gonna get stuff out of SQL. So uh, doing this in Power BI is, is relatively straightforward, but uh, so it's not all demo. I mean, it's not all slides. I did, I've put together a few demos here just to show you how we, how we would do that. It, these slides are based on, you say, get data, you say, connect a SQL server, the information I supplied it was um, actually an Azure SQL database. You can spin one of those up very uh, cheaply. In fact, even when you're setting a new one up, you can say, I want to use AdventureWorks. So you may have come across that, but it's Microsoft's make-believe company with some real data that you can actually query. So uh, I connected to that. What that ends up looking like is I have a connection. It creates these different queries. So a query in the language of, um, this is Power Query up here at the top, and or it's going to use M code to connect to data and import it. If we look at the actual code that gets generated, it looks something like this. I have it on a different slide. I'm gonna pull that up to make it actually readable here. Uh, oh, there it was. It looks like this, there we go. It's, it's a functional language that says, um, it, starts with, it always starts with the word let and ends with the word in like that. I'm gonna do it. It's gonna work. Yeah, cool. Um, and so yeah, it's actually a pretty simple script when you look at it. It's saying, hey, I'm, I'm gonna basically, each, each, each time on the left-hand side of the equal sign, you're just declaring a variable or you know, some other variable name. So let's make a variable called source and you end up calling this function, sql.database, and that will be the server name and the database name. All right, it's not too bad. Power BI knows how to store your credentials, so it can connect and query that stuff. Then you, you basically use that source word again here um, below in the next statement. You say, okay, I'm gonna make a variable called customer, and basically you're telling it, I just want you to navigate down, it's in the sales LT schema in the customer table and give me the data. 
And that's, real, that's really what it does. So it, this is how it talks to SQL Server, but the script for Oracle or any ODBC database or MySQL or Postgres will look really similar. Um, it might not, it won't say SQL.database, it, it might say ODBC.database or something like that. Um, but, and it may not use the word schema if that's not exactly the, the, the verbiage used by your data source. But at the end of the day, it creates, I can pull in um, basically four tables that load a model like this one out of AdventureWorks. In one table, we have customers. In another, we have products. In another, we have the sales order header. And in another, the sales order detail. So you, if you kind of take a look at this, you start to see why it's called a, a tabular model. So really, that's, that's what we're loading, four tables, each that have relationships between them. One thing to note about this tabular model is when you see the relationships, it, it looks a little bit like an ERD, if you're familiar with that, with rela relational databases. But it basically says, we're going to have one customer can place many, with the stars for many, can place many orders. And um, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Then we have order details. Each order belongs to one order detail line belongs to one order. And um, that order detail line can have many products on it. So that's sort of what the relationships explain. One thing that is important to pay attention to is these little arrows, because these arrows are going to define automatic filtering behavior. So this model really becomes important when you want to create your report and you're trying to get to a specific result. Um, what this means, basically, is if, if in the course of querying this data model, I filter a row in the customer table, it's going to automatically push filters across to the sales order header table, which is going to automatically push filters down to the sales order detail table. So you have to kind of follow those arrows along. And um, it really makes a big difference when you start to, start to get a specific result you're looking for. But at the, at the end of step one, you've got this really nice, um, let me show you kind of the output here. If we're, we're going to do the baking show thing where you kind of pull it out of the oven a little bit. Um, I've got my nice, uh, my nice model. Let's see here. Here's my advanced editor. That's why I couldn't click it. <clears throat> I've got this four queries that know, each know how to connect to a table in the database. And it loads this nice data model here. Uh, sorry. I should have named them better, uh, more clearly to myself. Um, yeah, this nice clean data model. If I click refresh, the Power BI knows, okay, I know what these four queries are. I can just click through each of the steps. Oh, okay, and now it's telling me this is an Azure SQL database with firewall rules, so I can't connect. But if the firewall rules were set up right, I could connect fine, and, and it would reload these tables. And using that, we can just basically like take, um, create visuals, <clears throat> drag and drop fields from our field set, and, and create some pretty nice stuff. So basically, this shows us order quantity by, this is our product name. And this is order quantity by company, by our customer. And then down here, we have a table full of information. And, and one of the cool things, this would be in the neat um, Power BI proper you know, technologies that aren't really the VertiPack engine or the data acquisition, but it does this cool cross-filtering stuff. So if I come in and pick a customer, you can see like immediately in the products graph, it kind of highlighted the parts of the bars that go to that customer. So it gives you some sense of what they buy right away. And then also it, it filtered my table down for the details. So I can see the detail order information just kind of at a glance. And it works no matter which one I pick here. If I pick, you know, bicycles or, uh, or whatever kind of customer I'm picking. If I want to see who's buying my classic vests and see the orders on that, then I can just click on that. It does cross filtering. So it's like, wow, this is, you know, at, at a pretty low level of effort, I've, I've built something pretty useful to myself. I've connected to my historical sales. I've pulled them in and everything worked great. So um, if all your data is always perfectly clean and easy to get to, then this is all you need to know. <laughs> I don't know if anyone in here would say, my data is always perfectly clean. I never have any data problems. I just connect to pre-formatted data sources and you know, it just the calculations all just work, right? So. Loved, I'd love for that to be the case, but um, there's always that extra 20% that creates 80% of the work, right? Um, so let's move on then to step two in our process here. We've got our, this data model so far. Takes my laptop a second to kind of catch up with that. There we go. Um, step two, what we're going to do is then we're going to try to get our current month sales out of Excel. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like in Power BI. It's, it, they make the user interface nice and simple. You'll say get data and connect to Excel. Um, 
by default, it's going to pull things up from the local Excel drive. So, um, it's, you know, basically you're going to try to find something locally. If I kind of do the cooking show trick here again, what that ends up looking like is I end up creating two new queries that are going to pull from local, a local file of like our current month sales header and our current month sales detail. Um, just to make this kind of fun, I, <laughs> I uh, decided to, I basically pulled the current data out of the database and then um, I messed with it a little bit. So I want to show you where I, where I kind of mess with things. So here's some things I often see. You've got a column with dates in it. Oh wait, no, it's not all dates. It's mostly dates, right? It's 99% dates. Someone puts in there the UNK or the TBD or the who knows what, their shopping list for the week and you're like, what? Okay, well, I'll have to handle that somehow. Um, here's one that's a little sneakier. You have these list of customer IDs, except one of them is 99999, which we all know is not a, I mean, that's sort of like, there's supposed to be this company knowledge. We all know that's not a real customer. Okay, well, I'm going to have to show that in my report somehow. And then there's always these good things, like you get Excel errors or whatever, right, from your, you know, inside the spreadsheet that somebody gives you. So you've got to watch out for that one. Um, in the... Um, in the detail file, I did something actually a little more devious. Let's see here, to make it hard on myself. Um, I put a negative one in there. That's not too bad for the order quantities. And then I broke out the headers onto two lines. I don't know if you've ever had to face that situation before, but it's really nice if, you know, your first row is always headers, that's fine. But every now and then you'll get one where it's like, oh no, they put the, oh no, they put headers on two lines and sometimes this, you know, this information changes and all these kinds of things. Power Query can help you, uh, rather than going back to your, to Larry, who keeps this spreadsheet, and being like, Larry, listen, you're going to change this format. Well, maybe Larry's not going to, right? You don't always have that sway. Sometimes you do. And, and if you can, by all means, simplify your data pipeline and keep it in a good format from cradle to grave. But if you can't, Power Query can help you record the steps it takes to process this stuff and get it cleaned up. So um, what, what Power Query is really doing is while it's building that query out, I've connected to my Excel worksheet. In fact, this is what this little source thing will say. Basically, Excel workbook, file.contents. Um, connect to this file and and then navigate to where? We're going to navigate to the first sheet. It's just called sales order header July 2008. Um, you, do a, you do a step called promote headers and kind of observe if you don't mind. Check this is actually kind of showing you like a preview of what the data looks like. So once we navigate to that sheet, what we see is really like that sheet and it hasn't yet put the top row and made it the headers. But when we do a step called promote headers, which is really like table.promote headers is the function, then the first row becomes column headers. It also will automatically add a step called change type to kind of like detect the types of what is in there and try to make an intelligent guess for you. Um, these, it's mostly just put in as, this, these little symbols mean it's basically any kind of alphanumeric text. So um, what, I, what I then did at that point was we basically, I tried to change the type of order date and what it showed me is, hey, you've got, when you did that, you've got an error in your column. Um, that, this was the one that said TBD. So it realized, is, I'm, I'm trying to make this thing into a date, but this row is an error. And what will happen is, it will, if you run the query at this point, it, it will Im import everything it can. And it will actually take the errors and stick them off in a different table. Um, but that's okay, but your report won't really be accurate, depending on how many rows get left out of your data set, right? Um, it has this nice step called, you can right click on the column header and say remove errors, you can filter them out if you want to, or you can replace the errors. Um, and it's warning me about inserting a step, I won't actually do it here. But uh, you can basically just say what do you want to replace the error values with, any rows that get errors. So this is nice, I can say okay, if you come across one of those, I just said B July 7th, you know, uh, 2008, B71-2008. Oh, I've got it open, so it's trying to it's trying to query it again. I've done. I've got it open. Let me close the files so you can. Uh, to be honest with you, it will often work even if your file's open. But I think when I save them in OneDrive, I think that OneDrive starts to mess with the file and causes a conflict. So um, anyway, if I get rid of that, then it will. Uh, I can just say refresh the preview. So in this screen, I'm not actually sucking in all the data. I'm just bringing in enough data from that file to get a preview of what it looks like. So now I've replaced the error and, it can, and then there we go, I replaced my error row with July 1st, 2008. Um, but I think at this point I've got other errors too. Let's see what they are over here. I had this, yeah, 
And this is kind of cool. It does this little mini data profiling thing for you. This is a new feature. It's kind of, it's, it's been released, but I think it's still kind of in beta. But it's giving you at least a quick hint about, hey, do I see any problems? Uh, do I preview any problems with this column, right? And that's what this little red line means. So in this step I had, I want you these to be numbers. Well, that was, um, you know, some, some text value. It couldn't do it. So I have another step, replace the errors. If it has an error, just make it null. Rather than making it zero, to say we paid zero tax, mm, I'm gonna make it null just in case. So, and then I went in the next step, we basically are replacing this value 999 with, let's say we had some one, two, three, four, five, six, we knew was valid, so. Um, to, to show what we do with the, uh, the detail, it's a little bit more fun actually. So when we, uh, we navigate to it, you see we have our headers on the first two rows. Um, what we can actually do is we can transpose this table. So there's, there's functions like this in R and Python as well, but it basically takes the table and just pivots it so that uh, I realized actually I need to take this step out of it. These two shouldn't, don't belong here. Um, let's see what that looks like without these two. There we go. Yeah, if we transpose it, then it takes these two, these two first rows become the first two columns. And then we can actually uh, combine these two columns. Merge columns, there you go. Yep, I want to insert the step. Yeah, sure, we'll see. There we go, I could merge them if I want to. And then transpose them back. And then promote the headers back up to the top. Um, I'm probably not going to apply this step because I probably just broke my query because I come along later and rename some of the headers, but uh, we'll, we'll deal with that later. So that's kind of cool, right? You can like, if you get two or three lines worth of headers, it, it's remembering all these steps. So every time you hit refresh, it runs through those steps. It's kind of like a macro if you're used to that. You know, it's, it's remembering, it's recording for you while you're going. Um, having done that, what we can do now is we can have a step called how many things have I broken here? We'll see. Um, we create a step basically called append query. So please ignore the error, but look up here where it says table.combine, and it pretty much says I'm gonna take the, the stuff from my SQL database and I'm gonna combine it with the things from my, the query from my Excel. So as long as the columns are named the same, it can just stick them all together, right? So rather than ever having to copy and paste from one spreadsheet to another, um, it's going to, in the right order, because it knows the steps it's supposed to follow, pull things out of SQL, pull things out of Excel, and then stick them together and load all that data into the data model. Um, I'm gonna say do not apply these because I totally messed up my steps earlier, but that's all right. What it, you know, what it ends up looking like then is our data model looks a lot the same, except that these are the, these are the tables that actually get loaded by the Excel sheet. I don't really need them to appear in my data model though because I've already appended all the rows from them into my existing tables. So now that when all those things come in, we see that we have orders from July, not just from June like we had before. Um, we also get a bigger, yeah, I kind of randomize the quantity so we get a much bigger spike of information there. Um, okay, so given that, so that's just an example of how you might pull in data from Excel and SQL, and uh, get, get it one into one picture of things that actually map to like your company customers or things like that. Let me, let me show you those screenshots again about how to do replace values. I also wanted to mention sometimes when you say append queries, and this was the step to do that, um, it will warn you down at the bottom about privacy levels, which is kind of a smart thing to do. It's like, hey, some of this data came out of SQL Server and some of it came from Excel. Are you sure that that's okay? Because think of ultimately what you'll probably do is if you publish this file, you're taking all that data and pushing it up to the cloud. So it, it tries to be sensitive. Uh, at least it gives you some ways to not accidentally pull in data you don't mean to. But often I usually check that box that's like just ignore privacy levels because I'm dealing with all company data. It's gonna be fine. So before I go on, let me just ask, any, any questions so far? Does this scenario kind of ring a bell or make sense? Well, this is the cool thing, the cool thing that you can do, and the reason to go through all this effort is once you get that data loaded into that database model, you can write some very cool calculations on that, on that model um, because of those automatic filters that are gonna go around and because You've got all your data in one place now. It's loaded into a VertiPak database, is what it is. And uh, 
what we will use is a, there's a language called DAX. So if you've used Power Pivot, you've actually come across DAX before as well. Anytime you used a sum function or an average or a count, it looked like Excel, but that was kind of intentional. It was actually a language called DAX. Um, and l let me show you just some examples of this. So this ca you can get very deep into writing complicated queries, but I want to just give you kind of a flavor of why you might want to <laughs> before, you know, so that you know, like, is it worth it for me to do that or not, right? Um, let's see here. Well, maybe I'll have to jump to my other workbook. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Um, what I've created here is a pivot, is a pivot table that groups up all the products by their category. So this is a really nice built-in measure called the matrix that will kind of, it comes with these little plus and minus bars. It looks just like a pivot table, right? They call it a matrix in Power BI. And I wanna look at the columns left to right, if you don't mind, don't feel too overwhelmed by the information. Um, what we, for, the first thing we did was we just drug this column called order quantity, which came out of sales order detail. You can kind of see when it pops up. It came out of our detail table. And we put it, we just had to drag it into this matrix. And, you know, because of that audit, because of that arrow that goes between category and product, and then that arrow that goes from product to sales order detail, that just sort of works. It knows how to group up, um, it knows how to group up the categories on the products. So this seems a little bit like automagical. <laughs> and, and that's the really cool thing that it can do is like with no effort hardly at all, it just, worked. It even detected the relationships between the two columns. I didn't even have to define that. Um, and the automagic is cool. It's really good for answering the basic questions. But then there's that next question that will come up like, okay, so what, if we wanted to answer the questions, what percent of our total sales in quantity is, are these items? And then what percent of their category are these items? So we're going to use DAX to answer that question. So let me show, let me start by showing some simple sample DAX. Um, I made a measure called total quantity. So you define your measures over here and you can stick them in any table you want to. Um, some people create a whole new table that's just called measures. So all their measures are in one place and they know where to find them. But here's a sample of what this one looks like. It's quite straightforward. I'm just saying, okay, total quantity is gonna equal the sum of everything in this column, right? Of, of order quantity. So it's really just kind of the same thing. Um, the, the reason you might make such a simple measure is you can highlight them and under the modeling tab, you can apply your own like custom formatting to it if you want one to look like a percent, one to look like a decimal or a not. So that's kind of nice. Um, something to keep in mind too is there's just what's going on in the DAX and the VertiPak database engine, there's always a filter context that is kind of invisible. I hate to say it that way, but you, you, you need, you, based on what your visual looks like, it's setting the filter context. So you can see that this measure always just equals the sum of order quantity. Um, one way to think about filter context is because I drug category onto the rows of this pivot table, it's creating a filter context. It's filtering all the sales down to just those that apply to bike racks. That's how DAX thinks about it anyway. So it, I, in the past I was like, hey, uh, putting something on a row is not really filtering it. But when it's, if you think about it going row by row and calculating each of these things, I mean, yeah, it is kind of applying a filter, isn't it? If you had to do this, you know, row by row and do the sums, you like, okay, just give me the things that are caps, just give me the things that are chains. And that, that's kind of what's happening. Um, that, that'll come in handy later when we look at the next one. So the next measure I was, I was gonna calculate was like, let's get a measure that just shows us the total of all the quantity, no matter what. And that's where you get into using statements like the calculate statement. The calculate statement is like really very core to DAX. So if you learn, if you want to learn DAX, if you need to, if you end up using Power BI or Power Pivot at work, or even analysis services tabular, it can really help you out to understand the calculate statement. Um, what this essentially saying is I'm going to calculate total quantity, which we know is the sum of order quantity, but you can also manipulate that filter context. So this is a, a function that will basically say, if I have any filters on this table called product, remove them. <laughs> so what that, what that does, as it goes down, it calculates and calculates, it'll say, all right, I'm gonna calculate total quantity. What filter context do I have? Oh, well, I would, I would be filtering by bike rack since I'm on the bike racks row, except because I'm inside this calculate statement, my filter context has been changed and any filters based on products are lifted. 
So it basically just shows me everything over and over and over again, the total at the bottom. Now that we have those two statements, we can do a cool measure that basically calculates what is the, what percent of the total does each category contribute to the total. And what that, we just do another measure that is so simple now that you've kind of handled the complexity of how to calculate it. You just say, give me the total quantity divided by that measure, the total quantity of all items. And boom, it works. It's 15%, 11%, and as we always hope, it adds up to 100%, right? That's what we're going for, right? Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. You're like, 105, how'd that work, right? Um, now, to do something a little more complicated, I could ask, okay, touring bikes. Well, actually, that's the whole category. I need to go into a category to get some products. So I'm gonna click this plus sign to expand it. It gives us a lot of products. Um, each, each item has its own different quantity, but the total for this whole touring bikes category is 2,631. So how do we calculate that? I have this other measure, the total quantity for all, uh, all category. We again use the calculate statement. We're gonna calculate total quantity, that's all good. There's a different function called all except. And this basically means I want you to lift any filters on this product table except those that are applied to the category. So. It no, so, if, so even though it's on this line says, I want Touring 2000 Blue 60, that would be a product level filter. This all except lifts that condition, but it doesn't lift the filter that's on category. So it takes a while to get thinking in terms of DAX. Like that's, this is kind of the learning curve. It's probably not even the word. I kind of think of this as like a, a BMX bike jump. You kind of have to do at some point. If you want to get really into Power BI, y you start out and it's real simple and there's a rapid uh, on-ramp. You know, you get going and you get the cross-filtering and you're like, this works really good. Now, how do I do this? <laughs> and then you're like, okay, I gotta stop and watch some videos and read some books and I, you can figure it out. If you can do advanced Excel, you can definitely figure this out. You just kinda have to learn how they built the database to automatically filter stuff and then how you can, it's, it's kinda cool because it's almost like a database that automatically filters and you tell it when not to. <laughs> it's almost, yeah, you know what I mean? Those relationships define a filter by default kind of behavior. And you use DAX to almost be like, here's when I want you to ignore those automatic behaviors. It's, it's a different way of thinking, but when it comes to just straight analysis, it usually works pretty well, right? It's, it's, in fact, I think it stands for data analysis expressions is what the acronym DAX means, right? So. Um, if you're in a Microsoft world, it's gonna be helpful, or in a Microsoft data processing world. Um, so that's how we calculated that, and for each one, it can go along and it, it calculates it correctly, which is pretty cool. And then we make a nice, simple, you've done that complex part, we make a nice, simple measure that says, what's the percent of the category? I, get, I take the total quantity and divide it by my total quantity for the category, and I get this nice, even, you know, 10, 10, 8, 8, 8 6, 6. So, I show that not so much so you can come away and be a DAX expert, but boy, you might look at it and be like, why would I mess with Power BI or why would I mess with loading this data model? Um, well, it could, it could be handy. If you're asked for the same analysis week after week or month after month, let's say you set up a workbook with your data, it connects to your spreadsheets and your databases. It, it does the hard work that you may end up, you may right now be doing every week. You might be copying and pasting things out of there. You might be like, oh, I gotta go in and I gotta delete all the subtotal rows out of this report I export. That's a pretty common scenario. All that kind of thing. Power Query can remember those steps for you and just bring it in, right? Um, and then you can define these complicated measures where it's cool because once you set the logic up once, I can, I can now slice and dice not just by products, but I could slice this by customers or I could slice this by many other dimensions. Time is a, you know, one that comes up in a lot, all, almost all of our analyses, right? Um, so that, that's just a flavor of DAX and why, why you might use it, why you might care is really the, <laughs> is really the question because it is a big investment to learn a whole new language or new technology. Any, any questions so far for, through step three before we do our final step? Yes, absolutely. That running total is a really good one. Um, I probably, I pro that's a good point. I probably should not uh, try to do that calculation here on the fly because it does take some, I always have to go look up, how do you do that again? 
But there is definitely a rank function, so you, if you can get things sorted the way you want them, you can, you know what I mean, kind of figure out what's the total. The other thing that I think, I, I was just gonna check really quick, they, they often have quick, what they'll call quick measures too, which they're just gonna write DAX for you. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't surprise me if somehow they had created one to sort of like, you can fill in a template. So here's some of the different quick measures that they'll have. Uh, percentage of difference, all kinds of stuff. Rolling averages, month over month changes, assuming you're using, and it does have a running total DAX, yeah? So I'm, I don't often use these, but I probably should. <laughs> yeah, but um, just, just kind of as an idea of what is possible. So this is helpful. I, I would say it's, it's almost like I'd want to encourage people to be like, go use these, but also stop and try to understand why they work the way they do. Otherwise, you can start to, you can, man, you can get so frustrated um, trying to figure out like, you know what I mean? When you get the total, especially when you start seeing those totals that it's the same number on every single row, you're like, what, what did I do? How is this possible? And you can see actually the DAX that it generated here. It's, it's fairly sophisticated. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, they're using a filter statement, they're using an all selected statement, and they're using an is on or after statement. So these are all functions you'd have to go and look up and be like, what, what is that doing, right? Um, Little, little tough, but just like when you started learning Excel, you know, if you can remember that first college class, or I don't know, probably a lot of, oh my goodness, I don't teach Excel in college anymore. You're probably too young, a lot of you are too young for that, but if you can remember the first time you sat down and you just look at these just like cells, rows and columns, and you're like, what am I supposed to do with this, right? But you, you learned it, you got it. I can teach Excel in public schools and Oh, really? Well, that's fair. I guess so, like Google Sheets and all that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Google does want the kids in their products early, and they're trying to push it, I'm sure. I still that's funny. Excel, but my sister's seven years younger than me, hmm. hmm. and she didn't grow up wearing Microsoft products. Interesting. Okay, well, hats off to Google for getting in there. I'm sure they're offering them a lot of good deals on technology to do that. So, And they are good products, so, which they really are just basically like Excel, right? So, um, but anyway, I'm just saying it's a similar kind of learning curve. At first, you don't know what you're doing. You learn one function, you learn another, and before you know it, you're a, you're a grandmaster, so. Um, but let me do that final uh, scenario here really quick where I, had, I have a spreadsheet. I'm gonna go back to home and open up my query editor. So there's two screens. There's sort of like the Power BI desktop and then the query editor. Query editor is saying, here's how I want you to go get all this data. And I have this new groups query in which um, essentially, it connects to another spreadsheet, and uh, it navigates to a tab. These are always, you see these steps all the time. When we navigate there, you kind of finally see, oh, what this is is like kind of a mapping between uh, the category names of our products and just some random new group. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you at work also, where they're like, yeah, yeah, uh, that's not how we categorize our stuff. We use it some, we categorize it some other way and it's not in the system, right? It's always never in the system for some reason. I don't, know, I don't know how these businesses run without data in their systems, but it's never in there, right? It's always in some other random place. Um, so so we, we, we can pull this in. It takes, it bas I just randomly assign things into this group, A, B, C, and D. Let's say these were like how we're gonna manage the inventory or something like that for these products, right? We're gonna treat these as A's and these as B's. Um, now that I've got that, I, you know, it's simple to connect to Excel, it's simple to import. Now that I've got it imported, I can create a relationship in my data model that ties these new groups by their category name to my official product categories. This is a little arrow that means it's gonna filter both ways, basically. If I pick a category, it'll filter down the groups, and if I pick a group, it'll filter the categories. And filters just flow all over this data model after a while. They get quite complicated with, you know, lines going in all directions. Um, but once you've, once you've done that, then I can very easily just kind of search for my, my new group field I pulled in. I added it to my fields here and, you know, boom, it's, it's, uh, it's grouping them. A's are all, here's the categories that were in A's. I'm gonna have to collapse all these somehow. But, um, and then, you know, and then the products under those categories and it, it just works, which is pretty cool. So it makes it easier for your end user to analyze. Uh, without having to say, hey, uh, ERP team, I need you to load these groups, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you guys, you know, have an SAP team or something like that. They'll be like, okay, yeah, sure, we'll get that done in nine months. You know, we'll have a table for you. Um, you know, <laughs> this is a lot easier. You could at least get it done day one and then start working on hopefully building it into your system. Um, you know, it can, you could say, is this an enabler of bad behavior? Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes. Um, depends, it just depends on what those groups really mean. Are they only good for the year? You know, are they... 
are, or are they something that's like, hey, this is core to our strategy. We should get this data in our, you know, in the data pipeline in the right way. Uh, then we should, you know, that's what you ought to do. But, uh, but that's pretty cool. So I'm going to leave off kind of the demo kind of at this point where we've, we've combined data from Excel. We've, you know, added in our own categories. Some possible next steps you could take, though, I, I never even actually published this out to the Power BI service. But if any of these spreadsheets were stored in SharePoint, uh, SharePoint 365, um, you could, the Power BI service can just refresh data right from that SharePoint file live. So that's kind of a way of using Excel as a data source. SharePoint is good about keeping different versions of the file, so at least you have some kind of data backup and you know, recovery if someone modifies the file in, a, in an adverse way. Um, it also, yeah, you can connect to SharePoint. If you don't use SharePoint 365, that's where you might turn to that technology like a data gateway. So a gateway is really just a piece of software that runs inside your network, and the Power BI service knows how to talk to the gateway, and the gateway knows how to talk to your other data sources inside the network. So it's, it's a gateway. It's a, it's a tunnel for the Power BI service to talk to. Um, so you can set that up to talk to spreadsheets and query spreadsheets and feed that data back up. So. If you're totally, if you're like, no, we have no cloud except for Power BI, that's, gateways are really important to you. They're gonna become useful. Um, yeah, other, other next steps you might take, um, yeah, I guess that was it, mostly use SharePoint. So we added the custom category. Um, so besides that, I just wanted to mention that um, I, I'm definitely happy to help if you ever have any questions. Uh, here's my contact info. Oops, no, here's my contact info. I'll get there. Um, just one moment. This is, where, this is where playing games as a kid really helps. You click fast. Um, so yeah, that's my contact info if you ever need anything. And actually, if you are interested in getting into Power BI or interested in any kind of like, you know, work, you know, taking on Power BI work, please let me know too, because it's uh, always good to meet, meet good people. So um, we, we definitely have at least, at least 10 minutes here for Q&A. Does anybody have any questions? Any, and it doesn't have to be on this demo, just Power BI in general. Uh, something about this talk probably caught your, caught your eye and you were like, man, I wish you would have answered this question. Feel, feel free to ask, and if I don't know, I'll just tell you I don't know. Yeah. Great, great, great question. So the question was, you know, if, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. What was Steven. Steven. Okay. Steven said he, he has experience with Tableau. He has experience with uh, ClickView, which have been around a long time and great, great products. Um, but if there's a job opening that says, I need Power BI, how can I kind of get from, from Tableau and ClickView and kind of translate my knowledge? Uh, that's a great question. And it, I think that um, Microsoft does provide, they call it guided learning. It's not always the easiest thing to find, but they, they are pretty good. The guided learnings are good because uh, there are videos and also demos that are somewhat interactive. Um, if you have any kind of database that you can connect to or Excel file, uh, definitely see, you know, try to connect to that with Power BI. It'll, it'll probably connect to it. But you are right about the Mac. I also have a Mac and I'm dual booting right now as you probably saw, right? That is a hindrance. Um, the, I also have a cloud PC I can run when I need to, so, but um, Power BI desktop is only for Windows, so that was actually probably the only reason I do that. I needed that in SQL Server Management Studio and all that stuff. I still do have Mac OS X on here as well, so. Um, it, but I, I would encourage you, your skills will translate well. Um, you, you just need to learn, do, were you into Tableau enough to be like writing Tableau functions and doing like table functions and stuff? And Okay. Yeah, yeah. The the running total yeah. thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. That's it, you're exactly right. So you end up like. Um, 
Yeah, it, there, there's definitely a learning curve when you get to writing the advanced functions. Now, on the other hand, if they've already written some of the models, some, I mean, the good thing about those measures is, yeah, they're hard to hammer out, but once you get them, you just, you, you just drag and drop after that, right? You just drag and drop them where you need to, and they work. So um, anyway, you, you definitely could do it. Uh, other ways to get hands-on experience. I'd love to, f it, the hard thing about getting those new jobs is always like, oh, we want you to have experience with this. And you're like, okay, I can't get any experience with this unless I actually get to work with this. Um, but you could definitely create some samples at home. They have a, it's free to download, desktop's free to download. Um, and you can publish to web for free. That's like public, totally public publishing. So, you know, don't use your whatever current employer's date or anything. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's a way to get started. It'd be kind of cool to go into the portfolio or something of like, here's what I've done. So. Yeah, my pleasure, sure. Yes, sir. Nice. Ooh, I like that question. So the qu you probably heard, but why learn Power BI when learning a programming language is more future-proof? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you, you probably should know both, <laughs> is the answer. Um, I, I definitely know enough Python and R to kind of be dangerous. One thing I didn't really demonstrate is that you can also use, well, you can use Python and R both to create visuals with their scripts, and in the query editor, I can use R as a, and, and Python as a data source. Uh, let's see how we get in more here. Um, so if you already have scripts that connect to your databases or data sources, and uh, do some of that processing, you can actually just copy and paste them. And so the Power BI service will create its own virtual environment or its own R environment and, and be able to run those things. Um, so that's, that's kind of nifty that it can do that. Uh, it's not always the most efficient, but sometimes it's more efficient than what, what Power BI is doing. Um, I, the only other reason why, I guess, is I think what Power BI is doing for you here is it's packaging together a lot of helpful things in one box, <laughs> so I can put it that way, where I could pretty quickly, I'm connecting to data, I'm, I'm putting it together, and I'm making visuals, and I'm publishing it, and I can get you know from question to answer pretty rapidly. Now, if I'm very skilled in the, in the programming language, I can, you could get to that question, you know, you can get question to answer quickly as well. You know, use the CSV functions, import them, maybe do that data cleanup, and, and maybe you know ggplot, or I've just mixed lang languages, but you know what I mean, you know ggplot2, or you know how to do py, uh, Python visualizations, and you can shoot graphs out. But even if you do that, it's not like your, your end report consumer can view it online and then share that and then see it on their mobile device, you know, so, and it may not refresh automatically, which is part of what the Power BI services are doing for you. So it's taking some real low level technologies and putting some very nice value add services on top of it. Um, businesses tend to value that kind of, you know, whatever saves time and whatever saves effort. So uh, that, it can make you more valuable to business is probably why, why learn it. But don't, don't not learn a programming language, I would agree with you. <laughs> Always know a programming language or two. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, great question, thank you. Uh, so he mentions SSRS, that refers to SQL Server Reporting Services, which you may have come across, it's been around a long time in computer world. Um, one thing, they, they definitely cover two different use cases. So they even call SSRS now, they'll call that paginated reports. So it's intended for those reports that really you are probably going to print or you could want to print. And um, one thing, one limitation of Power BI, for example, is like, hopefully this will pull up on this demo here. On this table, I, I can create a report subscription that would send this out, send this page out, or I could print this. It even has a cool like export to PowerPoint or something. Oh, that's only from the service once you publish it. Um, but it just, what it does is it just cuts this table off. Like whatever's visible, that's what prints. <laughs> and there's all these rows under here that you know, people might be like, well, uh, where'd all the data go? You know, where'd all my detail go? Um, an SSRS report, you can be very specific about, hey, every time you reach a new category, make a new page, or just keep, keep on printing it until you print all the rows in this, this data set. Um, SSRS also got more sophisticated. It was around longer, so they got to cool features like data-driven subscriptions, like it can watch for data changes and then blast out a report when the data changes. This doesn't do that quite yet. <laughs> um, but they are, they're merging the products in so in as much as like they want the Power BI service to be able to host both kinds of reports. 
and they want SSRS reports to be able to connect to these Power BI data sets, these tabular data models, and pull the data out of there. So pretty soon, I think within a, hopefully by the, by the end of the year, I think, you'll be able to download like, they may be two products. You may have like Report Builder, which is for paginated reports, and Power BI Desktop, which is for dashboards and Power BI reports. It's kind of a confusing name now, but. Um, you could, build, you could build one data set and create both kinds of reports because they do, they serve a different audience a lot of times, right? This is kind of intended to be more interactive where I'm gonna click on it. An SSRS report is usually more static where it's like, this is the picture, take it or leave it kind of, you know? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah, to say, to say where it'll be in, in, even in six months has proved to be kind of hard because they really do release every month a whole new set of features. So there's like an hour long YouTube video every month to watch about here's everything that changed, you know, in the desktop, in the service, and in the Power BI mobile app. Um, that's a good question about if the Power BI mobile app could just render those SSRS reports on the mobile device, that'd be kind of cool. It would get you sort of an out of the box feature, you wouldn't have to build a custom mobile app. Do you think that those emergency responders would want to go into like the Power BI app though? Would they be okay with that or do they want to stay in the app that you guys are developing? That would probably be something for a business analyst. Okay, okay. Yeah, that would be the downside to it is you'd have to like say, hey, you got to go to Power BI, click on the yellow icon on your phone or whatever. Yeah. Um, but there, now there is a different SKU of Power BI called Power BI Embedded where you can use their services to like embed into your app. And so you get a, this kind of experience, like the cross-filtering and all that kind of just works. Uh, well, what I mean to say is you can take that technology and embed it at the web layer of your app. It's kind of like, it's like becomes a set of APIs for you to call, basically. Does so, SSRS offer that same? I don't think so. I don't think so, no. But it also has some APIs where you can call and export data and things like that. But um, that sounds pretty complicated on that scenario, so. Yeah, yes, sorry. Okay. Right, that's a, that's a great question. You know, she's talking about kind of like a very specific, like a, the text may be in various formats and trying to identify when is it, when the page breaks are. I think it is better than Excel. I think it's better than writing complicated Excel formulas. If you know how to write Python, uh, that sounds a lot like a regular expression to me, and Python's very good at handling regular expressions that to, to split that text apart. Um, so that, that would be what I would probably go with if you know how to do Python. I don't know if this would be better than that. But if your goal is to get it into an Excel spreadsheet kind of cleaned up, you could use this Power Query technology. It's inside of Excel, so you would say like get data. And you, it is good about like, okay, sh you know, show me this text and split it apart by, by colons, right? It could do like, it's really good about that kind of thing. And then um, it's very good about drilling into JSON. It's, I should have shown a JSON example because it's pretty awesome about that. Like it knows how to expand out the JSON. So I want to go down to the third level of this node and turn that into a table. Um, 
uh, yeah, I, I'd have to see that specific scenario, but it, it would be worth trying, definitely worth, worth a shot to see, because sometimes it'll surprise you with the, like, oh, I just clicked that button and it did it, you know? <laughs> depending on how, it depends on how much your source varies, too. It sounds like it can vary some, but, oh, it can vary a lot, yeah. So, okay, was that, Jess, was that all of our time? I thought, was it, I see the high sign? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, thank you all. Those are great questions. I, I hope that this was helpful to you. I, I know the presentation will be, has been recorded, I think, today and will be online. So uh, if I can help with anything, um, feel free to shoot me a note and I'm happy to help. Thanks for coming today.